before we start our episode today, this is just a reminder, History Hack does have a Patreon account and all of your donations are gratefully appreciated. There's lots of perks on there, secret groups on Facebook. Do get involved. We would love to see more of you. Enjoy the episode today. Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. How exciting I'm here with Boney today. Boney, we don't often come on together. I know, you, you try to avoid me a lot of the time. It's, I it's know, I spend my entire life trying to schedule myself away from you. <laughs> I do not, that's a lie. Boney, who's with us today? We've got a fantastic guest. We've got Matthew Conian with him, and he has written many, many books about many, many things, including Egyptology, Egyptology, the Marx Brothers, which we will have to have you back for because I'm a huge Marx Brothers fan, um, and Jane Austen. But he's gone a bit gruesome with his latest book because he's telling us the tale of Dr. Perhaps Mr. Crippen, him very self. But the twist here is that Matthew's the first author to look at this with the results of DNA evidence as well. So we're going to get into all of this, but let's get this out of the way first, Matthew. Who was Holly Harvey Crippen? And sub-question, was he really a doctor? Right, well, he was a a bit of a mystery really I mean he seems to have been one of those people who um, can sort of be whatever he needs to be depending on the company he's in at, at the time um, he had moved in a in a theatrical circle most of most of their the friends that they saw were in the London theatre world uh, but for for some whatever reason he himself had always been um, in the involved in the wilder fringes of of quack medicine he'd been an eye and ear specialist um a deafness curer um a uh dentist uh at this point when the when the the case begins uh he's working uh he's making homeopathic remedies uh by by mail people would write to him with their problems and he would make up these utterly useless preparations and and mail them off um so he is certainly in he's certainly working in in the medical world but no uh he's not a doctor much uh though the prosecution would have wanted him to be one for reasons that i i guess we'll we'll come to but if you look at the transcripts of his trial He's always referred to as Mr. Uh, because he, he isn't a doctor. He was never entitled to call himself doctor in Britain. Uh, in America, uh, where he had been at one time, he was, all, he was even there off, off the, the official books by that stage. And the, the um, qualification that he had that, that ever enabled him to call himself a doctor um, was in homeopathy, um, which is a pseudoscience essentially it's certainly not surgery it's certainly not any of the things that the prosecution needed him to be which is why the kind of doctor myth was so very carefully built up and it's why my book is called Mr Crippen to to make it very plain that it's it's a break from tradition he's not Dr Crippen well that's cracked all over my interpretation of this story at the very beginning <laughs> <laughs> Another thing as well is obviously we're going to talk about his wife, but she's not his first wife. He'd had another wife. Had she not died in dodgy circumstances? Yes, uh, he had had a, a previous marriage, but which frustratingly little is known other than uh, some odd kind of coincidences and pre-echoes of, of, of what happened later. Uh, she died um, relatively young. They had a young child. Um, the second she died, pretty much, he packed their son off to to his parents, and then had virtually nothing to do with with any of them again from from then on. In fact, when he's um, when the police uh, interview him, he has to make two guesses each for the year that his wife died and for the for the year that his son was born, and he gets his son's birth year wrong both times. Um, he seems to have completely just just shunted that side of his life away. But when uh, the case blew up. Uh, there was very briefly um, a, a lot of attention to it in, in the press because the brother of his first 
wife came forward with a story that uh, there was foul play potentially, that she was terrified of him and that he was forcing her to have operations. Um, and he's, very, he's rather vague as to what these may be, but one assumes that they are something like the operation that we're told his, his second wife had, which was uh, the removal of the ovaries um, to prevent childbirth. Um, but this story, although, although the, the, the press of the world runs with it for a day or two, uh, then just, just vanishes, completely disappears from the record. So either it was investigated and, and was found to be worthless, or for some other reason it just disappeared. But it's extremely intriguing now, but it's, it's virtually impossible to find out much more about it than that. That, sorry, that, that, I, I saw the look on Alex's face when you said that it's likely that she had her ovaries removed as well. That's, that's incredibly extreme, especially for the time. It is. Um, it's certainly, uh, Cora, his second wife, had had that operation. Uh, whether it was done um, for some emergency reason or not, uh, I don't know, but there is this strange uh, echo. Uh, and then again, of course, uh, there's the possibility uh, that he may have been uh, considering something similar with uh, the woman who, who would presumably have become his third wife, his mistress, uh, Ethel. Um, because again, there are some more, I mean, I don't want to give too much away, uh, but there are more odd echoes. Um, he seems to have been somebody who, um, didn't have a lot of luck in terms of having children, but supposedly he was somebody who wanted children. Uh, but he certainly packed his first son off uh, pretty sharpish. Um, so I was going to say, it's like you can't even remember the year your actual child was born. I mean, Matt's got one child. Matt, do you know what year she was born? <laughs> 2003. Pretty clear in, her, clear in your mind, yeah? Oh, yeah. I, I remember <laughs> all of it. <laughs> she's, she's lovely. She's she's abandoned me now and gone off to university. So, uh, you know. And you still remember that. when she was born. Um, it's she's odd. And lovely and needed me. Now she doesn't need me anymore. <laughs> it's just, he just already is striking me as odd. But that doesn't necessarily mean a monster, does it? No, that's right. I mean, he, he certainly doesn't. Well, there are certainly many, many aspects uh, of him that are not terribly admirable, including um, the way he made his money, which was basically mm. exploiting um, people who were ill um, by providing them remedies which he knew full well were, were utterly useless for money. Well, let's talk about Cora, because she was quite well known in her own right, wasn't, wasn't she? She was moderately well known i mean i think if she, had she been better known the the, the story might have had a, a different ending I mean, she was or she had been a musical star she was american like crippin uh now living in london with him she had originally wanted to be an opera singer but had been hadn't cut the mustard there so she'd kind of gone into music hall as as the next best thing um, but had had found very little success there either i mean she did get some bookings but but she certainly never made a name for herself. And by the time that the, the case begins, uh, she's been out of the game for a long time. The only reason why she's still associated with that world is because she's now involved with the, uh, the Musical Ladies Benevolent Guild, which is a, a charity, a charitable and social organization. So via that means, she kept in with, with all of her musical friends. Uh, but she she certainly wasn't a, a performer anymore. Uh, very frustrated, very lonely in a country that she wasn't her country and which she didn't particularly care for. In a you know living in a gloomy house in in uh, in London. Um, basically, you know, just just living for for her social life, um, but without much else to uh, to satisfy her and the the kind of resentments that that grew between her and Crippin. Um, I think would, would have been in very large measure um, lessened had she been a successful performer, which is, which is what she dreamed of being. People kind of salivate, don't they, over the middle classes in suburbia. Um, and I'm guessing this is like potentially why it's best to slap doctor on him as well, because the more respectable they sound, the more exciting it is that this is all so gruesome. 
Yes, I mean, the, it, it is certainly, uh, it is the kind of the, the, the quintessential um, suburban murder story, uh, as uh, George Orwell writes in, in his famous essay, The Decline of the English Murder. He, uh, he puts it forward as, as uh, one of the, the kind of classic English murder cases that, that, that people so love to read about after Sunday lunch. Um, it, is, it is very much a case kind of viewed through twitching lace curtains. Um, Having said that, the Crippins were relatively exotic blooms on on the suburban scene. I mean, Crippin was an office man; he had office hours. But there, they were a relatively gaudy uh, couple. They and their friends were very extravagant um, and and noisy, uh, which which doesn't always sit well. Uh, it's it's something of a suburban faux pas to. Uh, to have uh, loud voices and slam slamming uh, cab doors after midnight, which I'm afraid I'm just they thinking would... of Margot and Jerry in The Good Life. Very Margot and Jerry, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the the papers land on the 14th of July, 1910, and they have a rather gruesome discovery splashed all over them, don't they? They do, yes. Uh, a, a a shapeless mass of flesh uh, with some internal organs but no limbs, uh, no genitals, no head and no bones found uh, in, in the coal cellar of the house that Crippen had been living in. It wasn't Crippen's house, it was, it was rented um, and he was about to vacate which, which I, I think is, is a point that should be made uh, more of. Um, but nonetheless in the house in which he was living uh, Chief Inspector Dew uh, lifted the bricks in the coal cellar, yes, and found uh, a fairly disgusting mess. Why did they go there? They went there because uh, Crippen had, um, Crippen's story was that his wife had left him after threatening to do so hundreds of times. She finally did um, around the start of, of 1910. Uh, he had had a mistress, uh, his secretary, Ethel Lenev, um, whom he'd been intimate with for many years, and he saw this as his chance to now start a new life with her. So partly so as to make that new life respectable seeming, uh, and also just to, just to shut down a lot of uh, constant questioning, he decided, according to his own statement, to tell all of her friends that she died, that she'd gone over to America, uh, and whilst in America, she had become ill and had died. He then moves Ethel into his house, and they live as man and wife, and they do so for about five months. And then suddenly, uh, a policeman appears on the door, and the story that he has to tell them is that her friends haven't believed him, that they've done some, some investigation of their own, they found that his stories don't match up, that he's told different people different things. Uh, he's told them that uh, she died in the presence of his son. Uh, they've got in touch with his son and he said, no, it's, I, I've had a completely different story with him and, and from him. And, and as far as I'm aware, uh, she wasn't in America at all. So that, that lie um, has, has come apart and now suddenly uh, the police are on his doorstep. The police um, are still not particularly inclined to take it all that seriously because it looks like um, a, a bohemian intrigue, you know, some, some typical London theatre world, bed hopping uh, scandal, marital scandal. Um, but um, unfortunately, Grippin uh, gets the wind up out of, after that first visit and decides to flee. When they return again, um, he's gone. He hasn't uh, left any uh, forwarding address. And it's been discovered that Ethel has fled with him. It's been discovered that she's fled or appears to have fled disguised as a boy, uh, which suddenly uh, ramps the thing up a good few notches. Uh, they go back to the house a few times and, and dig around about three separate occasions before they finally decide to have a look under the cellar floor. Uh, and then everything changes. So this is 
really the reason he's a prime suspect because he, he does a he does a bunk because he runs that's that's why they immediately start looking at him because exactly that yeah it's obviously it's the fact that the remains are found um in in the house he's been living in that the 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 matter that was being looked into was a missing persons case and then suddenly in this house uh what appears to be parts of a body have been found and the man himself has fled and f really from that moment on for the police and for the press and for pretty much everyone who's who's chronicled the case ever since um it, it's it's the most obvious imaginable sign of guilt and no other interpretation really has been has been considered or or, or permitted but I mean, all you all you have to do is put yourself in his place and it, it it all collapses like a house of cards, because here is a man who has been living a lie comfortably for five months, thinking that he has, uh, you know, if you believe his story, according to his story, um, thinking that he's that he's got away with getting out of this this difficult, rather sordid intrigue suddenly he learns uh, that he hasn't been believed, that the police have, have got involved, um, that the, you know, the, the, the worst that can happen is that he's going to be accused or certainly strongly suspected of very foul play because he's admitted he's lied about her, uh, what had happened to her. Um, the very best that could happen is that she is located, in which case this new life he's built for himself will be utterly destroyed. His private life will be paraded in the, in the media. Ethel will be humiliated. Um, so anyone in that position would do the same thing as well. As if, you, if, you, if you weren't guilty of murder and you didn't think for one minute that you would ever seriously be accused of murder why not do exactly what he said he did which is do a bunk wait for it all to calm down and then and then kind of take it from there so yes it is the behavior of a guilty man but it is also absolutely consistent with the behavior of the man he claimed to be there's the two issues already with him being a prime suspect aren't there so one his supposed supposed surgical skill just doesn't exist um, and also where the rest of the body is. Am I to understand that this is kind of based on why would he leave bits of it at the premises and yet make an effort to get rid of it all? Surely he would have been the lot. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that's the that was the kind of that was the one point that even at the time uh, kind of almost gave people pause. Uh, is if if he had so successfully got rid of n not just most of the body, but but obviously the you know the the important bits. He if if he'd been canny enough to get rid of the head, to get rid of the you know the the, the limbs, the the bones. Uh, why why bother to to um, to then leave some of it in in not only the house you've been living in, but at the house that that he knew he was going to be leaving soon. Um, and then, I mean, even if he was going to do that, why not bury it in the garden where where it would rot? You know, why why put it in the under the cellar floor of a house he was going to leave? It's it's a question that has rightly excited everyone, and the answers that have been put forward have all been you know madly speculative and and very very unsatisfying it just it doesn't it doesn't add up uh the best really that the prosecution could could come up with is that for some reason he'd been prevented from finishing the job which he was doing piecemeal that he he was either burning or or putting somewhere else dumping somewhere else the regent canal was was one suggestion uh the other pieces and, and for whatever reason it, it, that 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 uh, route had been had been closed, and he and he was forced to panic and and just just throw the last few bits in there, but um, it, it doesn't make sense. And and as you also say, yes, uh, it, it, if it was the remains of a dissected body, which is what it had to be for the prosecution to be sound, then yes, even their own medical experts conceded it was done with considerable surgical expertise, which he's just simply did not have so we've got a quack doctor on the run who seems to be handy with a scalpel which is starting to sound a bit familiar and it sort of captures captures the imagination so where where has mr crippen been um all this time when the story's been getting refed and refed and refed in the papers 
Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it happened very, very quickly. Uh, I mean, as soon as that body was found, um, it, 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 and and it was known that the the suspect the police wanted uh you know was on the run with his mistress and that the mistress was was in disguise it that was already enough to make it a um a a, a big a big press sensation even if the, the the very famous second act hadn't occurred if even if he'd been caught somewhere in london uh but no he had gone on the run with ethel they were planning to relocate to canada uh, and start a new life there. Um, they were planning to do that, I think, anyway, actually. Uh, but obviously, uh, their their plans were were given a, a considerable um, shove by the the sudden appearance of of the police on their on their step. So uh, they were circuitously making their way to Canada um, by by ship. And now, my uh, my boaty nerdness comes into play because some burgeoning technology. Uh, is what nails them in the end, isn't it? How do they catch him? Yeah, it's. I mean, unfortunately, it's it's one of the more overplayed parts of the of the story um, because um, once the uh, once it was ascertained um, which ship they were on, um, Inspector Jew decided to uh, stage an audacious. Uh, a coup de théâtre uh, uh, and arrest them when they disembarked in Canada. So he got on a faster ship than the one they were on, uh, and there was a kind of a, um, a race against time. Which uh, and th and this is what really cemented the case in in public imagination because it was the first time really that um, an unfolding police investigation was was being consumed like a like a thriller, like a serial. Um, in real time, every every morning, people would open their newspapers and get the next update in this in this unfolding saga. Um, wireless telegraphy is uh, is is the hero of the hour because supposedly um, Crippen was the first murderer caught by ship to shore radio. Uh, Captain Kendall of the Montrose spotted uh, in Sherlock Holmes fashion that uh, there was something peculiar about Mr. Robinson and his young son. Um, they seemed rather affectionate and she, uh, he was rather feminine and so on and so on. And this whole aspect um, has been kind of snowballed over the years and, and particularly in, in popular popular uh, melodramatic accounts. Um, cut down to size, there's actually a lot less to it. Um, they weren't really um, apprehended by uh, brilliant detective work uh, from, the, from the captain. And, and even the, uh, even the ship to shore radio played a, a secondary role, really. I mean, it was very, very important in terms of keeping the public uh, fed with, their, with their, their daily reports. But in actual fact, uh, too ordinary flesh and blood British bobbies uh, boarded the ship uh, and told told them that uh, that um, to look out for Crippen told them that uh, she was disguised as a boy uh, and even told them that the, the, the likely um, point of uh, arrival and departure so there was actually very little for for Kendall to do um, he seems to have had a lot of help anyway from uh, his subordinates who, who who didn't get much of a look in when uh, time came to to tell the story um, but uh, th that whole element the 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 kind of the second act the the chase across the sea uh, owes an awful lot more to to uh, the media than uh, to to any uh, more sober uh, rendering of what happened. I'm puzzled by the idiocy of making themselves more conspicuous by dressing her up as a boy. Like, surely if he hadn't been walking around with a live pantomime character, he may have stood more of a chance of getting away. I'm also chuckling at the fact that he was bound for Canada and that Dr. Crippen or Mr. Crippen, Boney, could have been your granddad if he got away with it. <laughs> 
But yeah, surely if they just like marginally changed their appearance and been more subtle and also, OK, you're going with the whole boy thing, but then stop feeling her up in front of people. It's it's very, very strange. It's it's <laughs> it's utterly baffling. I mean, the, the only possible kind of way you can you can anchor it to to sanity at all, I think, is that he had spent the last uh, few decades of his life immersed in in the world of theatre and of make believe and of pantomime and of musical um his his wife did a did a a, a male drag routine uh, he apparently once uh, did did some some female drag and was was considered rather rather effective and it, he might have just had this strangely unrealistic uh idea in his mind of what of what uh, he or Ethel were, were capable of but yes you're absolutely right it was a ridiculous thing to have done um and she doesn't appear to have to have even been particularly good i mean again it's part of the captain kendall mystique that he he you know he saw through their disguise and he set all these traps and but in actual fact chief inspector dew said when when he got on the ship at the other end and arrested them he was utterly staggered that anyone could have thought she was a boy for a single second I mean, she, <laughs> she, she was just a girl a girl with short hair and a cap i love it you think you think for actors they do try a little bit harder than that <laughs> yeah, yes yeah <laughs> so let, let, let's get to the trial they're, they're you know to be melodramatic they're dragged back to, to to london and the trial begins what happens there because the trial itself is is interesting in itself as a, as, as a sort of key part of all this. It's it's very interesting, um, mainly because uh, it's so clearly um, serving no particular purpose. Uh, Crippen's guilt uh, was 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 certain from from you know the the, the moment he he fled them that he had been already tried and convicted in the newspapers. And one of the things that I that most made me want to write this book is. It struck me as it was it, the case was a curious mixture of uh, all those things that I that I mentioned earlier that that Orwell uh, identified as you know the, the great English murder. It's got all these period trappings, the you know the gaslight, the gloomy cellar, all that stuff. But on the other hand, it's an extremely modern case because it's it's kind of the first really important example of what I would suggest is one of the um, biggest um, problems of the modern world, which is trial by media. Um, there was simply no way uh, going into that court case, short of pulling off a miracle, uh, that anybody in the jury or, or the public at large were going to have their mind changed. And, and that is exactly what has happened, because um, if you look at any of the previous books uh, on the case prior to mine, um, they hardly mention his defense at all. They, they talk at great length about the prosecution. The defense, they only kind of mention in passing with kind of innuendos and, uh, and, and suggestions that, that uh, the, the, the witnesses were, were um, insincere, that they'd been tricked into giving evidence, blah, 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 blah. Um, in actual fact, when you, when you look at the, the court transcripts, the defense produced experts of equal caliber to the experts of the prosecution who held and explained and stuck to entirely differing views. Uh, views, what's more, that have since been shown to have almost certainly been correct. Um, but it's as if they weren't heard. It's as if it passed over the, the heads of the jury like, like, like pixie dust. Uh, then and ever since, um, it, it's, it, they're almost inaudible in the record uh, because, because the, the narrative, the grand narrative of Crippin the Monster uh, had been so firmly cemented in everyone's minds by so many months of, of sensationalistic uh, media. I love it. It's just madness. So obviously he's guilty, um, found guilty. Even. Yeah. Uh, your book is based on new evidence, isn't it? Where did this evidence come from? Yes. I mean, it's not when, when you say based on it, 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 it doesn't rely on it um, as anything other than a, than a, than a coup de grace. Yeah. Um, 
it's, I, I mean, I, I, I aim to show that the, the case is, is fundamentally unsound, uh, you know, as it stands. Um, but uh, there is this tremendous coup de grace, which um, again owes its existence to to one of these peculiar kind of splits in in how this case is is, is received and interpreted. Uh, over here in Britain, it's it's uh, it's. Um, a, a, a kind of a, a piece of English folklore. It's a, it's a bit of fun. It's it's a, a kind of a, an old dark house murder mystery um, that nobody is in, feels inclined to take at all seriously. In America, it's very different because in America, the Crippins uh, family still exist, uh, and there's a guy called James Patrick Crippin uh, who's uh, uh, who I've got in touch with who's in his 80s now uh, and there's nothing there's nothing campy or or um or vintage about the case to him to him it's uh it's just um an outstanding injustice and uh he um has been leading a campaign uh very unsuccessfully sadly to have the case re-examined and have the conviction overturned and he uh got in touch with a guy called john trestrail who is a toxicologist and an expert in criminal poisoning. Um, and he was always baffled by the, the oddity that if Crippen had poisoned his wife, as he appeared to have done, and as the prosecution alleged, that would have been for the reasons that, that hundreds of other uh, domestic murderers uh, poisoned people they wanted to get rid of, which was to make it look like an illness or, 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 you know, an accident or, or, or not as foul play. It seemed very bizarre to John Trestrail that having done this, he would then dismember the body, uh, thus, thus making it completely pointless uh, the, 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 the subtle means by which he, he, he brought about her death. So Trestrail decided to, uh, to examine further and the idea was hit upon to find some of the DNA of the remains that were found in the cellar to see uh, if, if they could be identified as definitely Cora's or not. So he got involved with a guy in the University of um, Michigan, I think, um, called Dr. David Foran. And they acquired some of the material evidence that was still preserved um, on, on um, microscope slides and were able to obtain some of that and took a DNA read reading. Uh, which at the time and still occasionally now was subject to a lot of um, um, disbelief and, and poo-pooing and uh, maybe, the, uh, maybe the, the results, the test wasn't, you know, um, kosher. Uh, maybe the, the sample was contaminated, which is to misunderstand how, how the test works. Um, but... Uh, it wasn't. It's been. It's been duplicated. It's been published. It's absolutely correct and above the board stuff. They found um, female descendants of Cora because uh, mitochondrial DNA is passed down the maternal line. So they got a good uh, DNA sample from her female descendants. They compared it with the flesh that was used in evidence, which was the, the piece of the piece of flesh that supposedly had a scar on it, which matched up with a scar on Cora's body. That's why they, they used that particular piece. Um, the the defense argued that it wasn't a scar, it was a fold in the skin, uh, which is almost certainly what it was. But anyway, they, they compared the DNA, they found that it most definitely was not Cora. But what they were certainly not expecting to find was that they discovered it wasn't even female. For some reason, somehow, uh, the remains of an unknown male ended up in Crippen's cellar. And nobody knows who, how, when, or why, but it is the death knell for, for Crippen's conviction. So he didn't do it then? Well, unless unless he uh... or, or is that spoiling the book? I don't, I don't... <laughs> well, no, no, I don't want you to give everything away. <laughs> People with a vested interest in in his guilt um, would could say with some justification. Well, all, all you've done is is turn two uh, two mysteries. Uh, sorry, it's turned one mystery into two. Uh, he still uh, got an extremely suspicious. 
disappearance. His wife's um, his wife was never located. What happened to her has never been discovered. He lied about that. He had good reason to uh, to to behave suspiciously. So the, his suspicion there hasn't gone away. Uh, and now you've got this whole other body in his house. Um, how did that get there too? So if you wanted to, you could you could say it makes him even more suspicious. But but I think that's that's really clutching at very tiny straws okay there's enough not. reasonable sorry. Go you go i was saying as reasonable doubt goes that's quite a bit of it yeah i mean the judge actually said um quite obliviously in his summing up um of course if it were found that the remains were that of a male well then crippin would be entitled to walk free well they were so he was Okay, I'm not going to ask you to give away the ending. Do but do you have an idea of what you think did happen? Well, again, I mean, you 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 need to you really need to to sort of before you can even begin to consider that, um, you need to ask yourself what it is you you're trying to explain in the first place. Um, if you're trying to explain what happened to Cora. Uh, why she was never heard from again. That's, that's one question. If you want to explain uh, what, who that was in, in, in the cellar and how did it end up there and was Crippen, uh, did Crippen have anything to do with that? As it would seem, he surely must. Uh, that's, that's another question again. Um, I, I go through various suggestions um, for each. I don't have, I certainly don't have a strong um, suspicion as, as to how the bits of body ended up there. I do uh, very strongly feel that they were tarted up with secondary evidence um, to, uh, to make the case stick against Crippin, but I don't think, as, a as some people do, that the whole crime scene itself was a plant. Um, I think there are very many separate good reasons why that that really couldn't be tempting though it is uh, but I certainly do think it was tarted up with secondary evidence bits of her hair curlers and so on were found uh, in there which were would be an, an extremely uh, careless mistake for Crippen to have made if it was her body uh, now that we know it isn't the fact that it got mixed in with her hair curlers uh, smells rather unpleasant I think um, unfortunately for the police um, but as to, as to who that body belonged to, no, I, I, I don't know. As to what happened to Cora, I do have one uh, slightly left field uh, possibility, and it involves some, some brand new research in the book that was done into one of the secondary characters in the story, somebody that very early on Crippen uh, said uh, that was the likely person that Cora had run away to, which is an American uh, actor called Bruce Miller and he was actually found in America and dragged over to the trial uh, and it was generally felt to have been um, another own goal for Crippen and uh, a, a complete non-starter and he went back to America and that's where all the standard histories um, have said goodbye to him but we decided to look a little further into Bruce Miller and we turned up some rather disquieting things so I have a slight suspicion um, of which I will say no more. <laughs> uh, if you want, if you want to know more, you need to buy the book. You do tell everybody what the book is called. Uh, the book is called Mr. Crippen, Cora, and the Body in the Basement, and it's published by Pen and Sword. Excellent. And Boney, that's going to be on our bookshop, right? It is. There'll be a link in the description below all of our waffle before we get to the episode. <laughs> wonderful Matthew thank you so much for coming on to share thank you I loved looking through this book it was fantastic it's really it's really like hard not to just word bomb it out the answers and stuff but no <laughs> people must go and buy the book it's definitely worth it it's really interesting thank you so much thank you for having me when our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts so to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 
10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great book.